morning. We're looking to Luke in the ninth chapter. The passage that the kids were talking about in Sunday school. I don't know if, if Ms. Rhonda talked about this with the adults. Is that what y'all looked at? Okay. So Luke chapter 9 beginning of verse 28 and reading to verse 36. The Gospel according to Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings took place, took with him, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the two men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was speaking these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. The Gospel of our Lord. And you may be seated. Well, this morning we're continuing to look at um, Paul's message to the Corinthians and looking in 2 Corinthians. Uh, can anybody tell me what the theme of last Sunday's message was? What was the theme or the title of last Sunday? Anybody recall? <clears throat> We were talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and for three Sundays we were talking about what truth that is unique to Christianity that no other religion has. The resurrection. The resurrection. No other religion has a Savior who died and was raised and continues to live forever. And not only was that true of Jesus Christ, what happened with Jesus Christ became a promise for you and I that when we die, or if Christ comes back before we die, that we will receive a resurrection body too. We will become raised in glory. That we will be dazzling white. That our faces and our lives will shine. Uh, the uniqueness of that. We will take on fully the glory of God. Glory, God's glory will manifest itself in and through our lives. That's the direction of our hope as we live in this life right now. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And therefore, as we are living this life, we are called to live with a bold faith. A bold faith of this promise. To live with openness and frankness in our speech. To live with confidence, courageous, faithful, and forthright in our conduct. I was talking with someone uh, the other day uh, about their addiction and uh, they were dealing with addiction with alcohol and, and uh, they, they felt they, they wanted to change, that they needed to change. That if they didn't change, they felt that it eventually would end up killing them. 
And as they were talking about this, and I was talking to them on the phone, and, um, and I said, well, so how much have you drunk right now? She says, well, I've had four glasses. And as I'm talking to her, she has the fifth glass and finishes off the bottle. And we're talking a little bit further. And I said, did you open another bottle? She goes, how did you know? I'm like, here you are telling me that you want to be different. You want to change. Well, what are you doing? You're just perpetuating it. You're just continuing to go on. Not living courageous and boldly. Saying one thing out of the corner of their mouth, but then doing something else with the way that they're living their life. It's in a way as if there's a veil over her face. And as the Israelites in the Old Testament... They had a veil. They, they knew what they should do. They knew the law. They knew what was required of them. But they couldn't quite grasp it in their lives. And it's easy for us to say, well, yeah, those Old Testament people, they, they just didn't have it. They had the law of God. They had seen Moses come down from the mountain. And... and they had the Ten Commandments and they had the prophets and they had all of these things and they just didn't understand. They didn't. Well, we have to be honest that too often in our hearts and minds we have a veiled heart and mind too. We fail to understand to see the real meaning of the scriptures. We have a veil because of prejudice. We have presumptions, ideologies, that when we look at the scriptures, our ideologies, our beliefs, our views, taint what we see and we don't recognize the truth said a number of times whenever you pick up a commentary or if you're looking at a study Bible or you look, you, every person who writes about the scriptures even has viewpoints. And they're going to speak their biases into what they write and say. Not everything that has the guise of being Christian is biblical. Just because somebody puts a little cross on it, just because they wear a cross around their neck, just because they're ordained, doesn't mean that they speak biblical truth. They may speak what is popular and what is enjoyed, but it may not be the truth. They speak out of the ideologies, out of the presumptions of their own lives. They have a veil of prejudice. We have a veil of wishful thinking. We look for what we want. And we see what we like. You know, we talk about that God is love. God is merciful. And everybody's going to go to heaven because God is love. Doesn't it also say in the scripture that God is holy? And that he is an all-consuming fire. And God will not tolerate sin. Oh, but, but God's love and he'll just forget all of that. He'll ignore all of those things. Because God is love. And so we can do whatever we want all the time. And know that God will forgive us. Because God is merciful. God has no expectations of us. I mean, your parents never had any expectations for you, or did they? They just told you you could do whatever you good well wanted to do, right? All the time, anytime. Yeah, I see a young girl says no. <laughs> she goes, nope, my mama don't say that. 
No. If we had decent parents, they didn't say that. I mean, love disciplines. Love has expectations. And God is no different. He wants us to become like Him, holy and pure. Therefore, He has expectations for us. He has requirements. He wants us to become like Him. Which means that we can't do just whatever we good, well, please, any time and all the time. There are expectations. It's just wishful thinking to think otherwise. We have a veil of fragmented reasoning. We pick and choose the passages that we like. We see one aspect and we say, oh, I'll go with that, and we ignore another part. We proof text. We find the things that fit us and we ignore the whole content. Or sometimes we even do that to throw out the Bible. We say, oh, wow, well, in the Old Testament, they were mean, nasty, and God told them to kill people, and, and they wiped out whole villages. Therefore, the whole Bible is, is worthless. Well, that's a very fragmented view of Scripture. It's not taking in context the whole of the scripture and what God was doing and who Christ is and, and the plan and the process of what God has for his people. So we can fragment things, either from a negative of casting it out or a positive and saying, well, I only like these parts, we'll keep this part and ignore these other parts. There was a uh, a church leader in the early days of the church in the first several centuries that um, um, you know what it is on the computer to cut and paste? I remember a graduate student one time and, and she was like, you know, I've got white out all over my screen and I can't read things because I've been cutting and pasting on there. No, no, that's not how you cut <laughs> And cut and paste isn't meaning take a pair of scissors and cut it out and, and glue it together. But, you know, we, we can go through and we can exit out, take, delete something out and then condense it up and, and make it. Well, there was a, a person in the early centuries of the church that did that with the Bible. In a sense, he did a cut and paste. He cut out the parts of the Bible that he didn't like and just kept the parts of the Bibles that he did like. It was called, it today is still referred to as Marcionism. To cut and paste the Bible. To just have fragmented parts of the Bible. Well, we can't have that. That's a veil of fragmentation. It, it skews our reasoning when we only look at part of the truth. And we don't have the whole truth. We often judge people because we know part of the story. And we don't know the whole story in their life. So we have a fragmented reasoning. There's also a veil that comes between us and God. The veil of disobedience. And thinking that God has given me self-will. And, and I'm an American and I believe in independence. I can choose what I like. And self-will, will, when it rules, eventually hardens the heart. Because we fix ourselves in a direction that we progressively only do what we think and we like. That's the original sin. I mean, that's what was going on between Adam and Eve in the garden. They heard that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they got to choose what was good and evil. They would know as much as God. They wouldn't need God. 
because they would have knowledge of good and evil. And they could decide what was right for them. So we have the veil of disobedience. God has told us things that we should do in our life. But oh no, I want to do it my way. I think there was a famous singer that sang that. You older people would know who that was. I think his name was Frank. Yeah, Frank S. I'll do it my way. And he lived his life that way. There's also the veil of an unteachable spirit. There's a Scottish proverb that says, there's none so blind as those who will not see. I've already made up my mind. I'm determined. This is what it is. This is what I think. And you can't change my mind about it. And so we become blind to what the truth is because we refuse to open our eyes. We refuse to see other things. God gave us a free will, that is true. But if we insist on keeping it, we cannot discover His will. Think about that. Yes, God gave us a free will. But if we insist on our will, we cannot learn God's will. Whoever Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, gives us real freedom. Freedom from the law and sin, Paul wrote in Romans. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. And to the church at Galatia, he wrote, If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Not now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We have freedom from fear. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The love of God casts out all fear. And then Paul also wrote again in Romans, we are free from corruption. Creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Real freedom. And this life comes through a total transformation, a metamorphosis, like we think about the butterfly as he goes from 
the larva into the cocoon and then comes out through a process of work and struggle. You know that if, if you t go and find a cocoon with a butterfly in it and you think, I'll help that butterfly out and I'll help open his cocoon so he doesn't have to struggle so much. You know what happens? Two things happen. Well, three things, okay. He's not as colorful. He can't fly. And then he dies. Yeah, there's a process that we go through in the process of transformation, of the Holy Spirit working in our life. There are trials, there are disciplines, there are patterns in which we have to learn to live by in our heart, our mind, our body. So it's the, the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. Paul wrote also in Romans, present your bodies. There he's speaking of the whole of our life. Mind, soul, strength, everything about ourselves. As a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God by which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. If we're going to receive the indwelling presence of God in us, then we have to change. We have to learn how to let him live within us and through us. When we look in a mirror, there are two images that are present in the mirror. Two things that you can see when you look in a mirror. The first thing is, we see what we are becoming. We see the change. Now, if you've ever gone to the gym and work out, they'll, they'll have you go over and stand in front of a mirror or they'll take your picture of what you look like before you begin the exercise process. Not necessarily a glorious picture. <laughs> but you see that. And then as you're going through the exercise routines, you go back over to the mirror and you look in the mirror and you pose your body and they, they measure you and they take more pictures and you see the transformation of what's going across, what we are becoming as we discipline ourselves to the exercises, as we do the work of getting in shape physically, then we see what we are becoming. If we're in school and we're studying to become a a particular trade or, or a profession, we can see as we pass the tests, as we do this and we study that, that we are slowly becoming in the shaping of our mind, in the shaping of our lives, to be able to fulfill that profession. We, we begin to see, I don't need supervision all the time. I'm able to do some things by myself. And I can see what I'm becoming. The other thing that we see is what we are not yet. We see our shortcomings. And the reason for that is so that we can adjust. We can say, well, I need to work harder in this area. I need to shift my thinking here. I need to work on this exercise. I need to practice this a little bit more because I'm not quite getting there yet. It's not quite what I want to see and become. I'm not yet showing all the Christ-likeness that I would like to have in my life. And so as we look into that mirror, we see what, what we are. You know, thankfully, I am not who I used to be. We should be able to say that. Thank God, I am not who I used to be. I'm not quite yet where I want to be. There's still 
more to change in my life. God is not finished with me yet. There's more conditioning that has to go on in my life. I mean, we don't just become a Christian and then, boom, we're fixed, we're there. And I, sometimes, well, I got saved, I got sanctified, and immediately I became petrified. I'm the way that God wants me to be for the rest of my life. Thank God I'm not. There's still more to change. And Paul talks about here that we are being changed from one degree of glory into another degree of glory. Progressively. Not who I used to be. But I'm not yet quite where I want to be, where I need to be. The gospel of Christ gives us freedom. It gives us liberty. It is immediate. Not completed immediately, but it begins to work right at the moment that we surrender ourselves and not my will, but thy will be done. Take that first step and then it becomes progressive. We're seeing the changes. Things are not quite as hard as they used to be. The more that I read the Bible, the easier it is to read the Bible and the harder it is to read the Bible. The more that I pray, the easier it is to pray. And the more that I'm burdened with the need for prayer. The more that I shape my life into Christ's likeness, the easier there are some things that I don't have to deal with anymore. Those temptations are gone. I don't struggle with that issue anymore. Oh, it's not to say that there aren't some new issues. But there's a progression. There's a change that goes on. And there is the promise of permanency. That God has placed his seal of the Holy Spirit upon us. That we have a promise. That in the process of change, we will be resurrected in glory. We will become Christ-like. We will have eternity with God. Therefore, Paul says, don't lose heart. If you've ever been on a diet, if you've ever started an exercise regime, if you've ever started to study something and think, I'm going to become this, I'm going to become a welder, I'm going to become a nurse, I'm going to become a teacher, I'm going to become this or whatever it is, there are points along the road in where you say, forget it. Amen to that. <laughs> you know, I'm done with it. This is too hard. I can't do it. And he says, don't lose heart. This is who God wants you to be. This is what call God has called you to become. So you have to stick to it. There has to be a, a stick to itiveness that is there. There are two aspects of losing heart. One is that we lose the motivation. We become tired. We become afraid. We become timid. I'm just not smart enough. I'm not good enough. It's going to take too long. I just don't think I can make it. I, I think I'll just do something easier. We become weary. And so the diligence begins to fade away. Don't study as hard. Don't practice as often. And eventually, if we continue on that road, we discover that it's a slippery slope. And then eventually, we give up altogether. Paul reminds us 
Not to lose hope. Not to lose heart. But it reminds us that we renounced, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we renounced a life of sin. We said, thy will be done, not mine. We said, I am not going to be the old me anymore. I want to be who God created me to be. I don't want to keep falling in the same ditch over and over and over again. I've renounced the sin. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I covenanted with Him. You know, often we uh, correlate, and the Scripture correlates uh, the covenant that we make with God with the covenant of a marriage. And I've mentioned that numerous times before. You know, if the bride and groom come up and they say, I do in front of me, and, and you know, and I tell them, well, they put a ring on their finger, and that's to remind them of the fidelity that is to be forever and ever, and they, they make those vows for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, and, and it's like, this is going to be forever. I promise to never leave or forsake you. But I'm planning on sleeping with somebody else tonight. Or if not tonight, tomorrow night. Huh? Stop the wedding. Turn around and walk away. Well, God has asked us to commit to him. And we made that vow. Till death do us part, Lord. And even in death, you have promised that we will not part. You will actually resurrect me in glory. Amen. And so this is for now and forever. You got me lock, stock, and barrel. It's all. Or as in the Wesley Covenant says, Christ wants our all, or he will have nothing of us. If we do not give him our all, then he wants nothing of us. God doesn't want just part of our heart, part of our mind, part of our life. He wants us all in totality. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is the one who is saving you, redeeming you, forgiving you, and promising you a life everlasting. So we're not to be hypocritical. We're not to be tossed about by every wind and every weem that comes into our mind Every little temptation, say, oh, that looks so good, I think I'll go do it. Oh, that tastes good, I think I'll go do it. No, we made a commitment. We made a covenant. We renounced the old pattern. And we committed to a new life, to the truth of God's word. We're not going to adulterate it. We're not going to add to the scripture. We're not going to subtract from the scripture. We're not going to alter the scripture and read it the way that we would like to see it read. The truth is the truth. The truth has always been the truth. And the truth will always be the truth. We can't say, well, you know, society has changed now. We view things differently than the way they did back then. And so there are new ideas. And we need to change the Bible to fit with the way society thinks nowadays. This isn't about society. It's not about the cultural trends that ebb and flow. This is about the truth is the truth. And it will always be the truth. We're not going to adulterate. I mean, that's what it is. When we change the Bible, we commit adultery against God. 
We go to sleep with another God. Ourselves. And the world. We're not going to just try and soothe the ears of the other people so that they would come. You know, we, want, we want to be something that will be pleasing to everybody. It's not. The truth is hard. Jesus Christ has given us his example. He has shown us what it is to live contrary to the world. He has shown us by the pattern, the way that he loved and cared, and yet stayed true to the gospel, stayed true to his father. His house is not meant to be a den of thieves. This is who God is. And this is who I must be. And he has called us to a transformation. From glory to glory to glory. That's our calling. And that's the promise of his word. That ultimately we will know the full glory of God. Is that our hope today? Is it your hope today? If God sets the mirror in front of you right now, what do you see? What does his word reveal about you right now? The mercy of God calls us. Do not lose hope. This is the hope, the truth of the gospel. We can know within all of our being who God is. And we become like him if we are true to him. As we prepare to go to prayer and sing a prayer chorus, just ask the Lord this morning, Lord, put the mirror in front of me. Am I reflecting you? Is my life becoming more like you? Yes, every one of us is going to see faults and foibles and flaws and shortcomings. But are we coming more and more like Christ? If we are, Praise be to God. If there is something that says, you know, here's something you've been struggling with and working at for a while. Are you willing to give it over to me? And let me work the change in you? And let go. And let God. If you would stand with me and join as we sing this chorus. and The altar is open as a place of prayer. I invite you to make your heart the altar of the Lord this morning.
God, you are a holy God, gracious and merciful. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the promise of your presence right now in our lives, throughout our lives, and for all eternity as we give ourselves to you to follow you. Lord, may your will be done in and through us for the sake of your kingdom. That your glory might be seen in us and through us. That others, as they look to us, would see your presence in the changes that we are making in our lives. Lord, we give you thanks. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would continue to go with us as we go from this place of worship to live out our lives as your children in the world around us through all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do. May you be seen in us. To the glory of God we pray. Amen.